Um, our commentator today is Leanna Vardy. She's professor of history at the University of Buffalo, SUNY, and she's authored two books, The Physiocrats and the World of Enlightenment by Cambridge University Press and paperback fairly recently, 2014, and Land and the Loom, Peasants and Profit in Northern France, 1680 to 1800 by Duke University Press. She's published numerous articles, most notably Physiocratic Visions and Studies on Voltaire and the 18th Century, and three articles in the American Historical Review, I think that's pretty rare, um, entitled Rewriting the Lives of 18th Century Economists, 2009, and then earlier ones, including Imagining the Harvest in Early Modern Europe, and her Corin Prize winning article, Construing the Harvest, Farmers, Gleaners, and Officials in Early Modern France. She's editor of H France Fiction and Film for French Historians, which I am sure we have all enjoyed. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Julia for organizing this panel and making me a part of it. Certainly food for thought, and the pun is intended. The three papers deal with the relations between colonies and metropole, two with Saint-Domingue in particular, where, while a third approaches more generally the role of consumption of colonial products in 18th century France. Explanations about the nature of the French economy in the 18th century have gone through a number of phases over the past 250 years. But one common feature has been French competition with England. Why did France lag behind and where did the blame lie? Agriculturally, people argued there were not enough large farms. Leases on land were too restrictive and too short. Methods were updated. Multiple tolls increased the price of foodstuffs and discouraged their transit. Industrially, guilt stopped innovations and the movement of labor. Mechanization, although beginning in the cotton industry, was far behind England's. What is more, France was too committed to its luxury products geared towards an elite and export market. Its population, unlike England's, was too poor to constitute an internal market for manufactured products. Trade was indeed booming, but with little effect on the hinterland. Sugar, that jewel in the crown of colonial products, made Bordeaux merchants wealthy, but was mainly re-exported. If the balance of trade was positive on paper, it did not affect the overall economy. How could trade help, in any case, given all the restrictions placed on it and the power of monopolies? Adam Smith was driven to write The Wealth of Nations because of similar monopolies in England, but this was engulfed in the larger message of freedom of production and division of labor. Of course, French merchants were important, especially négociants who handled wholesale goods and chartered ships, because they were, in Marxism parlance, accumulating capital. They just didn't translate this mercantile capitalism into investments in industry as the script required and as was happening or had already happened in England. France was missing out on the Industrial Revolution. How happy these economic historians were when they contemplated John Holker, Oberkampf and Réveillon Go, guys, go. <laughs> Things changed some 30 years ago, partly with the demise of the Marxist model. Economic modernization was understood to take varied forms. Thus, handicrafts could be perfected and expanded alongside factory production, and here France was well positioned. Its agricultural productivity was higher than one had assumed, and England's successes were slightly downgraded, so that the gap between the two countries no longer seemed immense. Once the famous transition from feudalism to capitalism, uh, if you are as old as I am, uh, ceased to be a major issue and the Industrial Revolution was rendered less monolithic, a different sort of revolution emerged in historical writings in the 1990s the 18th century consumer revolution. It had been supposed for England, now was coming to be viewed as possible in France as well. 
the population deemed to have a greater income could then dis uh, dispose of it for extras and frivolities. One of the principles of a consumer revolution is the, the stuff that is viewed as an occasional treat turns into a necessity. This is what all the literature on luxury lamented, with only a few deeming such demand the source of economic growth. These writings have long been now been subjected to close scrutiny, and as Elizabeth Heath argues, it is time to move beyond theory to examine actual practice. What this, did this consumer revolution mean for France? Both Elizabeth Heath and Julia Landweber view it as transformative, a motor for change, in lines with scholars such as Colin Jones, Bill Sewell, and a slew of others. Landweber states that colonial products created a dynamic and that, quote, the desire for caffeinated products, specifically coffee, possessed propulsive powers, end quote. How so? Coffee turned from being an expensive import from Yemen to a cheap product produced in the Antilles. But Landweber is principally interested in the production of knowledge and divides the more, more disinterested approach of the metropoles, Jardin du Roi and Academy des Sciences from the money-making outlook of the colonial planters. Science and capitalism seem initially at odds until experiments and advice to producers emerged from Saint-Domingue, Martinique, and Guadeloupe themselves, emphasizing the need to upgrade the quality of the coffee and denouncing get-rich-quick schemes. Consumption of exotic pro products has a long history in Europe, Spices from the East enlivened medieval cuisine, but had no effect on production. The transformation that took place in the 17th, but especially the 18th century, was the transfer of tropical plants to French soil or to its colonies for mass production. Besides the Antilles, the French state sponsored cultivation of spices and medicinal plants in Mauritius and coffee on Ile Bourbon. And as we heard, uh, uh, plant planters and um, uh, individuals sm sm smuggled in samples from Suriname. Richard Grove in Green Imperialism showed the central role of botanical and acc acclimatization gardens established in the tropics themselves. Thus, knowledge about plants had the immediate consequence in the 18th century of turning into profitable enterprises. Heath does not stop there, but asks what effect these plantation goods, and coffee in particular, had on French lives. As we know, coffee and sugar changed the nature of breakfast. Like tobacco, they were also addictive, creating their own sustainable market. Printed cottons became wildly popular, but people could live without them. To cite Jones and Spang, the sans-culottes needed their coffee as much as they needed their bread. Heath, Elizabeth Heath urges us to, excuse me, to focus on material culture and to find the uh, location of merchants and retailers in the capital in order to better understand the diffusion of colonial products. She starts off with Jacques de Cona's claim that one in eight people in France were engaged in one way or another in colonial trade and cleverly tries to imagine whom this might involve. In the end, she rejects this assertion as unverifiable and beside the point. We return to Landweber's argument about the propulsive nature of coffee. The popularity of tr tropical products introduces desire into economic uh, calculation, challenging the idea that supply and demand were based on rational choice. Desire is volatile and incalculable, which is why it is such a pain. Advertisers soon learned to manipulate it, but even they couldn't predict sudden changes in fashion. Jan de Vries had a revelation about the importance of consumption and called it the motor for an industrious revolution.
Families in early modern Northern Europe were willing to work longer and harder in order to obtain more material goods. He does not probe further into the psychological effects of desire. Is it possible to dig deeper and argue that the adoption of foreign goods and fibers led to a new outlook? A more traditional approach stipulates that this consumption of colonial products habituated populations to purchasing ready-made goods in the 19th century. Elizabeth Heath concludes, however, and she's not alone in this, that new forms of consumption engendered new modes of life. For her, the question is not how many people made a living from colonial products, but how it shaped their existence. I am uncomfortable with that contention because it makes, to me at least, too much out of buying things. Perhaps respectability is indeed the way to think about all this. My problem is how to fend off projection when dealing with material culture. I, for example, may feel that consuming more made people more individualistic and greedy rather than more egalitarian. Did it make people more sensitive to slavery? People buy now at Walmart and from Amazon, even if they are aware that the companies, of the company's mistreatment of their workers because their goods are cheaper. On the material front, I note that the concept of clusters of goods has not been raised. Consumption of coffee required the pots in which to brew it, cups and spoons with which to drink in, not to mention doilies. I just threw it in. <laughs> thus stimulating a number of related industries. The consumer revolution served as a stimulus to production by multiplying related needs. French plantation owners and expats made fortunes out of these grimly produced colonial products. For them, the link to slavery did not have to be inferred, but was at the very heart of the matter. Planters, as Micah Alpal demonstrates, were a po powerful voice on the political scene at the start of the French Revolution, even if they appear to have paid no heed to warnings about the soil exhaustion that Landweber has described. Placed under special jurisdiction, the colonies did not form electoral assemblies nor elected deputies. Still, 18 chosen from the white elite made their way to Paris, and six planters were allowed to represent Saint-Domingue. Free blacks and mulattoes were excluded. They had their own representatives in Paris, who demanded to be heard with the support of the Société des Amis des Noirs. That support, however, did not translate into political clout, as the planters and merchants of Bordeaux, in particular, mounted a campaign against the abolition of slavery, and established the influential Club Massiac. It seemed impossible to separate Jean de Couleur from the issue of slavery, even if their own position on this was equivocal. Changes to French provincial and municipal organization in summer and fall 1789 spurred the white planters to take over urban administrations in their colony, set up a colonial assembly, and work on their own constitution. This was the culmination of the struggle against French control. To them, liberty did not refer to the individual so much as offer a chance to become self-governing. In Saint-Domingue, those who wanted to include Jean de Couleur were persecuted and even lynched by mobs of Petit Blanc. Openness to non-white participation in government was equivalent to opening the assembly to mob rule back in Paris. At the National Assembly, the issue of representation of Jean de Couleur remained afflicted by fears of abolitionism, and it would be up to the free blacks and slaves to mount their own rebellion. Um, this arc seems familiar, and I guess I'm, what I'm missing is the more detailed um, explanation of the role of uh, associations um, from, uh, the, uh, from France to the colonies. So I have two questions. Um, um, 
uh, con conditions in France in summer of 1789 are described as destabilizing. Does this refer to the content of decrees, like those of the 4th of August, or to the Declaration of the Rights of Man, of Man or were revolutionary actions destabilizing in themselves, such as the storming of the Bastille and the restructuring of municipalities? I was also very... Um, Curious about the term destabilization, which uh, you know seems to replace the the, the, the more familiar term uh, upheaval. Uh, I was also curious about the links among colonial representatives to the Constituent Assembly because it's about the only thing I know about this whole issue. <laughs> Were there any uh, um, links, uh, or was each delegation acting separately? They certainly were seated at different times. So six Saint-Domingue reps were allowed to sit by the decrees of 8th June and 4th July 1789, and seemed to have been in France already, rather than dispatched from the colony. Guadeloupe's two deputies were named by the Paris Comité of Colon and took their seats on 20 sep 22nd September 1789, but three more were elected in Guadeloupe itself and were seated on 27th July 1790. For Martinique, two reps were admitted on 14th October 1789. Pondicherry's deputy, elected to the third estate on 13th March 1789, was only admitted in summer 1790, and two deputies uh, for the Ile de France were on their way when, uh, when they drowned in a shipwreck in January 1791 and were replaced by two négociants in February. By my reckoning, the revolution had already shaken the foundations of France by the time representatives from these other colonies took their seats in the assembly. Were they more active in the clubs than the representatives from Saint-Domingue? Did they follow a different chronology? Where should we look for them? Did being deputies to the National Assembly matter at all? I must admit to being confused. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would any of you like to respond to Liana's comments to start? You want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, as far as associations go, I mean, it's very much kind of all of the above. There's, there's both a destabilizing and, you know, a, a time of upheaval. So I'd, I'd perhaps see them more as synonyms than antonyms. Um, if I understand correctly, though, the documentation isn't terribly good. Um, the colonial deputies from Saint-Domingue were indeed initially sent over for the second assembly of notables. And timelines okay. being what they were, they then became the... Uh, as States General Deputies. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Mark, but that's not the case. Okay. The original uh, deputies from Saint-Domingue uh, are chosen in Paris by Louis uh, Garcia. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I'll just briefly talk about the, the question about slavery and the, the traces, and I think that this is where the, the shorthand of my my very early stages of working through this. Um, actually, I'm trying to think about the way that slavery becomes something that we don't think about. Um, and so trying to think about a form of double consciousness in which people can consume the sugar, but not think about slavery. Um, and think, seeing that as part of um, what Marx will call the sort of emergence of commodity fetishism, where we sort of disassociate the actual social relations behind commodities and really just think about them as having their own agency. So I'm trying to think about, you know, what are the steps and processes by which that actually becomes a viable way of sort of looking at the world, where we, we sort of, we, we, we don't exactly ignore it, but we just don't think about it. We're sort of blind to it. And so I'm, I'm trying to use this to get at that that process, um, and and I agree that there's all sorts of complications and limitations, and I myself am worried about you know pushing it too far, but trying to think about you know this is something which emerges historically, and so how does it emerge historically, and can the the empire and colonial commodities give us some sort of insight into how that process becomes a kind of generalized way of being in the world? <laughs> 
I just say something uh, in your comments, um, Liana, reminded me of, I've been reading Paul Friedman and rereading Sidney Mintz very recently, and thinking about these questions about, um, so spices were, were um, hugely popular in the Middle Ages until Europeans went off to fetch them themselves, and then as the price drops, the interest drops. But these new colonial commodities, uh, sugar and um, coffee especially, um, the price, as the price drops, the interest rises, rises, and I think it, it has to do pretty clearly with the fact that not it, it's not just Europeans now having control of the distribution, but of the production. Um, so there's so much going on there in terms of both the, the convergence of science and commerce and the consumption of goods and the changing meaning of it. Um, I don't. I don't, I don't have a specific response yet for some of what you're saying, but it's all really, really good stuff to think about. <laughs> Great. Okay, so um, if you would, uh, identify yourself um, and wait for the microphone um, before you make your comments. I guess we have to do this a little more formally. So, it's, uh, uh, in the back. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, so. Hi, I'm Leslie Tuttle from LSU, and um, those were really uh, thought-provoking papers, so thank you. Um, I would like to ask, I confess to being a great skeptic about neurohistory, but I'm wondering if we might want to invoke it here to think about this capacity of desire to transform things. You mentioned that um, many of these colonial commodities, tobacco, sugar, coffee, are addictive. Um, do you think that there is a way to historicize, cu culturally construct, what that might have meant for the people of the 18th century? Well, I could just start off with, in terms of coffee, they didn't yet have the language or concept of addiction exactly, um, but already in the late 17th century, um, there are concerned theologians and also um, uh, medical experts who are describing um, Basically, they're describing addiction. They're, they're saying that coffee has this unnatural ability to make its consumers uh, demand it more and more, and, and uh, more and more, not only keep wanting to drink it, but they, their desire for it increases how much they must drink it. Uh, and this was regarded as somehow devilish. Um, so it was regarded very problematically in the beginning. Um, by the 18th century, I haven't seen that much discussion of it. It seems to stop <clears throat> becoming a concern. I mean, I would say that um, I'm interested in the, the addictive quality insofar as it then sort of encourages repetitive action, which would seem to be the foundation for acquiring a new habit system way of acting in the world. And I've also thought about the way that, you know, coffee and sugar which seem to operate on this other level, which you don't, you sort of recognize that they're addictive, but they're not, not necessarily like look it in the eye and say, I have a serious coffee problem. <laughs> um, but the way that that then also conditions you to forms of what somebody like Moish Bastone talks about as abstract domination, which then becomes a fundamental part of modern capitalism. So thinking about those kinds of abstractions which happen in the world, um, and, and the emergence of capitalism, and thinking about the way that the addictive qualities then creates a very, a very, um, a foundation for those kinds of forms of domination. But I also think it's interesting that these are forms of uh, repetitive action that happen in the household, right? So they become very intimately connected with uh, the sort of most personal parts of everyday life. And so the way that that also then takes a sort of unsuspecting quality that pervades, the, sort of breaks down divisions between um, you know, public work and private work and the way those two boundaries become blurred. So. Thank you. I'm uh, Ronan Stein. Oh, we need to stand up, sorry. Uh, I'm uh, Ronan Steinberg from Michigan State University. I have a, uh, a quick, uh, very simple, uh, I think, question of fact to Julia, and then a question on approach to Elizabeth. So the question of fact is, uh, the map, the, I think it was the second or third slide that you showed, that kind of blue map with the routes. Um, if I understood it correctly, uh, 
the tr the routes from Yemen to France, where the plants go, th that's a land route? Um, how coffee originally reached France? Yeah, was, that looks was, like a land route a that land goes route. through the... It goes through the Ottoman Empire. Um, coffee went up the Red Sea uh, to uh, Cairo and Alexandria, and then also um, overland uh, to um, uh, Izmir or Smyrna and Istanbul, Constantinople. And then from these various eastern Levantine ports, um, it made its way across the Mediterranean to Marseille. Yes, so I know I know it's out of the uh, chronology, I guess, of your uh, project and maybe out of your interest, but I was struck by that because I was thinking about the people who made these journeys through that part of the world, since it's a land uh, uh, journey, I would imagine also in certain periods quite a dangerous one to make. Uh, you're passing through all kinds of areas, some of them probably hostile. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder what we know about that that particular. Maybe there, maybe there's a lot of research on that. I, I just don't know. I mean, it's it's a, it's it's a little before my period yeah. indeed. Um, but the the land caravans are certainly really interesting. But the Red Sea helps though, because right. they could go from Mocha, they could go Those by water pretty far up, and then more or less they're in Egypt. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. But anyway, yeah. and uh, the question on approach to Elizabeth, if I understood correctly when you started your presentation, and I think you said it again in your response to Liana, uh, one of your big interests is kind of how, I suppose, empire affects uh, the lives of people, right? Of, you know, on, on the most intimate uh, uh, spheres. And I know that there is a lot of what I would call social history in what you're doing. I understand the Moish Stone mm -hmm. and Lior Auslander conjunction here, as you know. But uh, I'm wondering whether to show everything that you show, the kind of commodity fetish uh, uh, business of how we can afford not to see the social relations that produce the stuff we consume. Um, but that, I always thought, doesn't tell us that the products mean to people what we think they mean to people. For that, we need to see what people m say about them. After all, I could consume a lot of things, iPods <laughs> and whatever, but if I don't say that they mean anything, then historians in the future will have to assume it, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking a kind of an inner life of empire approach of M.I. Rothschild, mm -hmm. kind of cultural <laughs> history, which calls for a different set of sources, right? The kind of correspondence. I don't know if those are available. She could do that. I, I know that's not her interest, but she could do that with her set of sources. So I'm wondering whether the tools of what I'd call cultural history um, might come in handy here if, if one can find the... Do you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say that um, this is really just one, one sort of layer of this project. And absolutely, I do plan to use these other sources because I agree. You, you, there's only so much you can say about, um, you know, 4,000 households have sugar tongs <laughs> or, or coffee grinders. Um, that gives you a point of saturation so you know those, that people are using them, but how they're thinking about that action. And I think there's two things. One, we do develop uh, habits and, and ways of thinking about the world that aren't necessarily uh, Highly, we're highly conscious of, right? But at the same time, there are things that we are, are conscious of, and I, I think that I do need to use the cultural, the cultural history sources, the letters, the diaries, the, the novels, novels will be uh, paintings, art. You know, those are all another layer to try and think about this experience and to think about the way that people are actually processing, processing it, and also thinking about the way that people are both recognizing, among other things, slavery, and then also sort of distancing themselves from it. So thinking about um, narratives of slavery in which it becomes you know, domesticated in some ways. It's these sort of genteel narratives of, of docile servants who are eager to, to help out versus uh, you know, figures who have been maimed and, and disfigured through the process. So absolutely, there's just another layer that I haven't gotten to yet, or I'm, I'm working with, but I haven't incorporated. Uh, so I think uh, behind Daryl, uh, the man. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, uh, well, I'll give it to Daryl. <laughs> I love. <laughs> so uh, hi, thank you for those wonderful papers. I, I'm Alan Telchin from Shippensburg University, and, and I had a question, I guess, for uh, Julia and Elizabeth. Obviously, it's clear from both of your papers, uh, and we knew this before, 
uh, that there is a, an ex a dramatic growth in the production and consumption of colonial products in the 18th century. What I was curious of, do you think at this point you have anything new to offer on sort of the shape of that growth? Are there any inflection points? Is it continuous? Is it increasing? Do you have any sense of, uh, again, beyond that it was here and then it ends up here, what does it look like in between? What kind of change do you see over time? Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, I'm my larger project is 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 going to do the in between, uh, not just the beginning and the end. Um, and I'm I'm doing very much. This is actually this is a, a totally new part for me, the production side of things in the agriculture. So I'm new to the whole colonial thing. I'm new to the Atlantic and the Caribbean. I, so I feel pretty um, uh, uh, like a, a, a neophyte here. I'm much more comfortable with the cultural consumption side of it in the metropole in in France and especially in Paris um, in some ways I wrestle with this project because I feel like I don't necessarily have a whole lot new to say um, there's a sort of a similar um, history that can be told for for a lot of colonial products and a lot of sort of uh, adopted foods um, uh, coffee tea and chocolate tobacco sugar um, but when you get into the the cultural nuances of it, I think I do have some new material um, and some new um, ways of thinking about it, especially in terms of how, what, kind of in response to the things that your project is also going to focus on about what people are thinking, which responds to the previous question, what people were thinking when they, when they chose to, to adopt these um, products. Um, and how did it change their behavior? And so I'm looking at advertising and I'm looking at clothing and all sorts of fashion issues and art as well. Um, so I think there is more to be said than has been said about it. I would, oh, I would say um, the, the mapping that I'm hoping to do, I'm hoping will reveal at least a, a far more complicated picture of that growth. Um, if only because it can allow us to start to see how colonial conception of colonial goods um, spread throughout the city over a four decade um, time span and also to think about concentrations of colonial goods in different neighborhoods of, of Paris among other places um, so that the different maps that I had the different points um, the different colors represented different decades and those are different layers that I'm hoping that you can begin to see the growth of, of, of colonial points of business and contact but also consumption of colonial goods over that four, peer, four decade time span and also start to think about like which communities in which neighborhoods had the strongest affiliations, um, how did they make connections with different parts of France and the French Empire, and to think about the movement of, between those different goods. So I'm hoping that being able to visualize it in the spatial dimension just will, in some ways, it'll, it will reinforce the picture that we already know, but we'll fine tune it in a way that provides interesting uh, details about who these people were um, and their backgrounds. I'm Daryl Hafter from Eastern Michigan University retired from Eastern Michigan <laughs> University, happily. And I'm, my question is primarily for Elizabeth and Julia, but also for uh, Liana, if you care to comment. You, you have mentioned um, capitalism and the, the effects of uh, slave trade and uh, commercial activity on it. And so I'm wondering whether you have thought at, about uh, whether, whether and what the effect of this activity was on the development of capitalism in metropolitan France. And you might want to define capitalism as you answer a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'll start. So um, I'm working with a definition of capitalism, I think generally um, drawing on Lukács and Moish Pistone uh, as the sort of generalizability of the commodity form 
and then drawing on Moish Pistone forms of, of abstract domination. So taking the idea of, of certain social relations emerging, forms of production and industrial production, but then thinking about these sort of more uh, abstract forms, I guess, of thinking about the commodity form as being the sort of structuring of, of social relations between individuals and thinking about the way that um, relationships between things become uh, seem to take on a life of their own and the social relations between producers and consumers, uh, capitalists and, and workers um, sort of get pushed below. Um, so that's the sort of working definition of capitalism and trying to think about um, how if capitalism is, is a is a system that must engender its own ways of thinking and acting in the world. It doesn't emerge, you know, all of, all of a sudden there's a factory and people start thinking, oh, this is the way that we act. I mean, it's taking an E.P. Thompson approach in some ways to think about what are the steps that, that provide the foundation for the kinds of ways of acting and thinking about the world that then be, create the possibility for industrial capitalism to become pervasive and general in society as a whole. Um, it's a pretty vague definition of capitalism, I realize at this point, but it's something that I'm trying to, to think about. And I mean, my goal really is to try and think about what role does empire and colonial commerce uh, play and the, pro the whole project goes from 1750 to 1950. So it's a, a long range of trying to think about different moments in which I think different uh, foundations and building blocks, in this case, emergence of forms of double consciousness and, and the commodity form, um, the move to free labor, um, these different steps in the emergence of modern capitalism, um, how this, the role of empire and commodity forms in contributing to the development of that in the metropole, um, either through the participation of people from metropolitan France in the colonies and forms of production, um, through their participation in transport and circulation of goods, and then also through the consumption of goods. So it's absolutely a story about metropolitan France and the way that capitalism and empires shape um, everyday life and, and what it means to be French in modern France. Um, that I think that I want to find another way than I, than I think some other earlier historiography has found to think about the way that empire shapes that, that, that the emergence of that, that system. So it's a general answer, but and I'm happy to answer more questions. So I'm, I'm one of those historians who really shies away from theory. I'm so in awe as I listen to you. I was like, I, I, can, I can't rattle these things off my head the way you do so fantastically. I wish I could. Um, so I don't really have a working definition of capitalism. I hadn't thought about that. But I have been thinking about mercantilism. Uh, mercantilism was a real problem. Uh, and I alluded to it a little bit in my paper, um, how you've got uh, the state is trying to um, control a set of um, an increasing empire, an economic empire, they're trying to control it for, for state profit, but they've got two different systems that are at odds with each other. On the one hand, they've got the East India Company that has one idea about how to profit from coffee, but then they've got these colonists who, that you both have the governors of the islands who are part of the state apparatus, and then you've got individual colonists, plantation owners, uh, planters, who are also hoping to profit from coffee. and because they're in different hemispheres, the Compagnie des Andes is, is completely opposed to what the, what the Caribbean planters want. Um, and the government is kind of caught in between, which is this really sort of peculiar situation that I haven't decided what I think about it yet. Um, but about how did uh, the growth of coffee um, shape metropolitan France as from a production standpoint, from a consumption standpoint, it was, it was enormous, I think. Um, there was, and also Sidney Mintz has really been influential to me in terms of thinking about how, and also the um, uh, John Garrigus's uh, new book, which I'm forgetting his partner's name, co-author on the, Bernard. thank you, Trevor <laughs> Bernard, sorry about that. Yes, The Plantation Machine is an amazing new book. Um, and uh, their, the, their vision that there is a industrial revolution happening avant la lettre, or it, no, one's, no one had acknowledged it previously, in the 18th century French Caribbean, um, 
coffee is clearly a part of that. Um, and uh, that is, um, you have the you you have a sort of industrial production of coffee by the late 18th century happening, and you've got Jan de Vries' industrious revolution shaping people's uh, ability and desire to buy the the goods, the material culture surrounding coffee, as well as the beans themselves. So there's uh, many different ways in which this is influencing, I think, changing lifestyles uh, in the metropole. Sort of an answer. Um, I think we have well, maybe one more. It's and we can be quick. I know people have to leave and they're hungry. Uh, I'm Julie Hardwick <laughs> from the um, University of Texas at Austin. I want to thank you for this wonderful panel. Although the papers were great, and Leanna, I thought your comment was great, and it was. Um, you know, this this has been a very um, slippery problem for us. Like, what is the impact of colonialism at home in France? And I was thinking not that cheerfully, this is the 30th anniversary of my first visit um, to the West. And, and, you know, in that time, there's been a lot of sort of general talk and, you know, very difficult to get some actual texture. And so I really love these projects. I want to say one thing about De Vries, who I admire in many ways, which is that women could get these goods on credit. <laughs> they didn't have to specialize their labor to get consumer goods. And so I think they specialized their labor, and that was important in increasing production all those things for other reasons. For instance, they had to pay taxes and they needed cash for that or it looked better than wet nursing. Huh? But for the consumer goods, they could get them on credit. I think it's important to remem remember that for a lot of reasons. My question for you is this though. I have a little side project going on um, about uh, a certain um, consumer revolution item, umbrellas and parasols and the consumer revolution. And so um, I would I started to wonder, for instance, like, what is the wood the handles were made of? You know, you know, but, and it's not a colonial good per se, but it's an adaption, obviously, of, a, of, a, of a, um, an Asian technology and a kind of uh, appropriation there. And I'm interested, actually, in the, um, the people, the uh, husbands and wives, teams who are making and selling these parasols and um, but, but what I'm, inter I'm interested in lots of things you had to say for, the, for those reasons, but my interest in that is about um, it's about the, the make, not only the making a living, but the way they live their lives and the meanings and all those things. It's about um, disruption and dislocation and stratification. Huh? And the risk, I liked your question about what we mean about capitalism here, because they were really encountering a lot of risk. Risk with desire, with changing desire, with changing tastes, with the fact people didn't have to get an umbrella or a parasol if they, if they couldn't afford it, even on credit, all kinds of things. And so um, in thinking about it from that side, the sort of adoption of these new goods. The, um, people's lives, working lives and, and other aspects of their lives were being transformed. But that issue for me about the risk involved with that and the sort of dislocation and disruption, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that in any of those. Quickly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Two minutes over. This one. You can take this one. Um, I mean, I would say that the disruption and dislocation potentially has, at least for historians, uh, provides productive terrain where people are thinking about and articulating moments where um, there are obviously larger economic shifts in which they're caught up and how they're making sense of those. Um, and in that moment of making sense of a dislocation, which I think one of the, the major things is that it's a dislocation that at a certain point people begin to say it's not just simply that there's a little there's a little something wrong, right? It's a much uh, emblematic of a much, much larger shift. But I think that one could look at those as thinking about, you know, horizons expanding and sort of lar older structures of, of thinking about the market as dissolving or beginning to crumble and the way that those, those dislocations then become very productive for thinking about new opportunities, new risks um, that maybe were not uh, viable in an earlier period or uh, of earlier years, but thinking about that as potentially creating this space where you know these new forms of activities and ways of thinking about the world can sort of seep in and then reshape possibilities for the future. And that's where I would go with that. Um, but I do love the, also the comment about the parasols because as soon as you start thinking about colonial commodities, you're like, there's blue in that dress. Or is it indigo? Is it woad? What, what kind? So thinking about how even these little things, um, you know, the influence, the design of parasols, 
um, and also the fabric and the texture. So how are they also being connected into these networks that they don't have control over but are, cre are creating possibilities as well as risks for them? I'm going to have to call it. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Exciting panel. Please have the conversations afterwards. Thank you.